Oh, welcome. And it's good to be together with you here to worship our Lord. And uh, our worship service begins uh, on the front page of your bulletin. So uh, one uh, news item is uh, Susan Gray's uh, mother has passed away. Uh, and so we want to especially pray for Susan and, and all, the, all of her family. And let us begin our, our worship service together. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Let the wicked abandon their ways. Let them turn to the Lord for mercy. And we continue with uh, words from Psalm 82. God has taken his place in the divine council. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Father, we come before your holy presence. And Lord, we ask that you would shower down your grace and your love before us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
And our reading this evening is from the prophet Joel, chapter 2, beginning of verse 29. Last uh, week we were at the part of Joel where uh, he says in the last days he would pour out his spirit on, on all flesh. And this is the tail end of this and going forward. Even on the male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth blood and fire, and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to place that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls." For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the future fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage, Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land and have cast lots for my people and have traded a boy for a prostitute, and have sold a girl for wine, and have drunk it.
And I now read to you from Revelation chapter 20. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Please stand for, with me for the, the final reading. From Luke chapter 17, beginning at verse 7, Jesus taught this. Will any one of you have, who has a servant 
plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and recline at the table. Will he not rather say, Prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. This is the gospel of our Lord. Amen. And please be seated. We've been working through the book of Joel. And uh, the prophets all, often, because they're in God's eternal perspective, they see as God sees, and they see the future, possible futures. And he talks about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, so good things are going to happen, he says, in the last days. And then it goes on, and these, are, these echo the words that Jesus also taught about the end days. He says, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's, that's the dividing point right there. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord and in our English versions, we'll have four capital le letters, L-O-R-D, to make sure we know that's the formal name of God. yud heh vav hey, we have those, those vowels. It's, it's the God of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the God of Israel. And everyone who calls upon his name shall be saved. For in, the Mount, in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape, and because the prophets tell us, especially Zechariah, that at that time all the nations are going to come against Israel. But the Messiah will return at that time and fight for his people. So there are those who will escape. So he says, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. For behold, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, God is coming to bring good to his people. I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage, Israel. Because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land. It's interesting that God doesn't say the land of the Israelites he says, my land. It's his land to do with what he wants. And that land he appointed to be for the people of Israel. And have cast lots for my people and have traded a boy or a prostitute and have sold a girl for wine and have drunk it. And I kind of cut off the reading there, but it does go on. God is bringing judgment in the last days. But a uh, I've got good news for you. It's, it's terrifying sounding, but when you go through all of the Hebrew scriptures and, you, and it's got the day of the Lord, it's, it's a day of joy for his people and it's a day of horrible darkness and judgment for those who oppose him. And of course, not all members of churches are true believers in Jesus. Not all people who have been born in the nation of Israel, if we see even after the, the Passover and through the sea, that many turned away from the Lord and, and angered him. But there have always been God's people that have survived. And he makes a distinction between his people that call upon his name, that love him, and those that oppose him, and those who oppose his people and his land. So how can we have confidence on the day of, of judgment that, uh, that we will be saved? 
will be on God's good side. Well, the plan, and it really is laid out so much in Isaiah 53, but the plan of God was is that, and he told his people in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, he told them that there was going to be a new day where he would have a new covenant with the people of Israel and with Jacob. He said, this is the covenant that I will make with them. I, I will forgive their sins and remember them no more. And that covenant was established, we confess, through Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, who was sent from God. He came down from heaven. In Isaiah, we're told that a, a virgin would give birth to a child and that a son would be given. And upon his shoulders would be the government. His name would be Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. And what we, we celebrate and what we think about during these days as we approach our celebration, and it's Good Friday is on the day of the beginning of Passover, we remember that the God of Israel sent his son to come and take human flesh to die in our place so that the new covenant would be put into effect and God would forgive us our sins and purify us and remember our sins no more. And it's with that confidence that we have that we can look forward to the return of the Lord, the day of the Lord. And I want to read through just a few passages in, in the New Testament that talk about that. The Apostle Paul, who was trained under Gamaliel, one of the greatest rabbis there was, he wrote a lot of our New Testament. In Romans 14, he says, Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. So he's saying that we will all stand before the judgment seat of God and each of us will give an account of himself to God. That's why often on a Sunday when we worship, I pray that our president, no matter what party and what year, and our politicians will have a sense of their accountability to God because we all have that accountability to him. And frankly, if all of our sins were publicly broadcast for everyone to know, it would be a humiliating time that we would not look forward to on the judgment day. But remember, God says in this new covenant that he will forgive us our sins and remember them no more. So we work through these things. One is that we're forgiven and our sins are washed away. They're covered. Just like the atonement, the day of atonement, that the sins are covered. We're covered by the blood of the Son of God. And yet still we have to give an account of ourselves to God. So what that does is it motivates us. It gives us some fear in our heart about that day, which is good. Some fears are really healthy. I have a bit of a Fear of heights, not really bad. I don't mind airplanes. Extreme heights are okay. Uh, but I remember going up this one elevator that was a glass elevator that went up 70 floors, and I did not like that at all. I remember once being with my son on a mountain trail. And where we lived in uh, Vancouver areas, we could be 55 degrees at the bottom of the mountain and walk up the trail, which he and I did for hours, and be in a foot of snow. 
Well, we got to a point where the trail narrowed. It was a cliff. I don't know how many hundred feet it went down. And I, I, it was icy. And I just told him, okay, we're turning around. So my son said, said to me, what's the matter, chicken? And I said, you betcha I'm afraid of falling down that cliff. So we went back. That's a healthy, it would be really a stupid thing not to be afraid of falling hundreds of feet, hours away from home down a mountain cliff. Some fears we thank God for. And I really think we can thank God for a proper fear and respect of him and to know the accountability we have before him because it motivates us in our life in some ways. That There's other motivations. There is love for other people. There is love for God. There is the love he puts in our hearts for the Holy Spirit. But there's also the fear of God, which is quite handy to have. And it says we will have to give an account of ourselves to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talks more about this accountability that we have. And it says, according to the grace of God given to me, this Apostle Paul again, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. In other words, he, he brought people to faith in the Lord. And he says, and someone else is building upon it. The Apostle Paul was a church planter. He started up new congregations. Now, he did stay in some of them up to three years or so to build upon them too, and that means teaching. But he was involved, and he says, let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it. In other words, the day of the Lord comes, it will be revealed what things we did that have eternal value and lasting to them, and what things don't. And Paul says it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. Now just wait until we get to the end, because we're going to look what the reading was in the gospel about our attitudes that are supposed to be towards rewards. And because of what Jesus taught there, I, I try not to even focus on rewards at all. But whether I do or not, the Bible says there is reward for serving him. Anyway, if anyone's work is built up, Paul says, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. In other words, you don't lose your place with God and your salvation and your forgiveness. But if it's not built right on the solid truth of God's word, it'll all burn up. When I was thinking through these things, I was thinking, you know how they have redacted statements? Government does it real often, you know. Okay, here's the emails you asked from the government. And then you get the email and 90% of the page is black, crossing out everything. And then there's a few words, and you go to the next one, like, well, thanks a lot for that. And that's how I kind of see this. We have to have proper motives. We have to build upon God's word. We have to be faithful and so on. And if we're not, it'll kind of be redacted out. We'll still be saved, but it'll be a pity, the waste that there was, because we didn't build upon God's truth and his word. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and servants of the mystery, stewards of the mysteries of God. We are servants of the Messiah and stewards of the mysteries of God. So when any of us is called to teach or preach especially, but really all of us, but especially those of us who stand up front and even have things since this uh, COVID thing, so many of my messages now have been recorded, and many pastors have. Uh, 
We are responsible. We are stewards for the word of God that he's given me. That's why, I, by the way, Hetty, we just got the whole book of Genesis in Braille. So make sure that I get that to you. And thank you for that beautiful solo. But uh, we're responsible for reading from the beginning of the Bible to the cover and knowing what's in it. And that's kind of why sometimes I'll just say this I know is for sure and differentiate, differentiate from something else if I'm not sure. Because we are servants of the Messiah and we are stewards of the mystery of God. Paul says, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. And he starts thinking about himself because some people were talking bad against him. He says, I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. In other words, we're not supposed to be afraid of what people say about us. We're supposed to be concerned about what the Lord thinks of us. He says, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time. That's the same thing he was talking about before in Romans. When we become judgments of judges of one another in a bad way, we're losing the fear of the Lord because he is the judge. That's his place. It's not for us to do. It's not that we're not supposed to differentiate between right and wrong, but we should not be people who are condemning others constantly. So he says... Do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his con commendation, not condemnation, commendation from God. So he looks also into our motives, the purposes of our heart. I think God was starting to work on me when I was in a, ninth grade. He should have just kind of gave up me, forgotten me, is my opinion, long, long time ago. But I had this ninth grade teacher, and for some reason, I don't know, it was a paper or something, but she just challenged me. And uh, it was something about loving things that we do for others. And she said, I can't remember the words, but basically, you have to ask the question, do we do anything with pure motives for anyone else? Because a lot of times if we do something nice for someone else, it makes us feel better. It makes us look better. And I started trying to think through that, and it really got me confused and so on. But that's the kind of thing that makes you start thinking like, the depravity that we have as human beings, that we've all sinned, and even in our motives, and I would say that without the Holy Spirit, she's right. It seems like all things we do have a self-serving motive to them. And Paul says here that he will disclose the purposes of our heart. A couple more. 2 Corinthians 5, and this is the passage we looked at on Sunday, actually. But there was a part of it that I didn't focus on. It says, yes, we are of good courage, and that means we are confident. And we would rather be away from the body and at home to look with the Lord. And how can he have that confidence? Because John writes in his gospel that these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. And how can we know that we have eternal life? Well, it's not by confidence in what we've done or not done. You know, if God was going to judge us, sometimes I think, well, God, this is a marathon, so I hope you're piling up all the things over many, many years. The uh, problem is, is he would have to also be piling up all the things that I haven't done and the things I should have done, the things I've said that are wrong. And so, and so it works against you either way. But still, it's a privilege that we have if we can live long and serve him. But Paul had this courage, this confidence that if he left this body, if he died, if the judgment came, the day of the Lord came, that he would be with the Lord. And how could he have that? 
Verse 9, he says, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. And that's the main thing of all this thing about the fear of the Lord and our motives and our accountability to be before the Lord. Because we know that God has given the promise of us of eternal life through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, so that we are justified by faith. Abraham, it says, his faith was counted as righteousness for him. And as we believe in the Son of God, he does it. Then we can know that we have eternal life. And we make it our aim to please him because we're still accountable. And we want to be accountable and we want to serve him the best we can all the days of our life. So he says, for we must all, and that's a big word, all, A-L-L, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are known is to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. Well, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this is John 5, 24, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. So to not be condemned means our sins are forgiven. They're taken away. Hopefully they're kind of redacted. So every sin, thought, word, and deed, what we've done, what we've left on, those are just kind of crossed out in black throughout. And hopefully I don't have a whole big book of all black, you know. But still they're taken away. And what is left is what he remembers for us as his people. And I will remind you that Jesus, Yeshua, was the Jewish Messiah. He came, first of all, you know, the gospel. I, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Paul says, because it is the power of God uh, unto salvation, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. God came to his chosen people first. And then we, Paul says, are like wild olive branches that are grafted in to the commonwealth of Israel, into the people of God. So finally, in Revelation 20, it says this, I saw a great white throne. And what's significant about these things is we have the Messiah sitting on the judgment throne. 2 Corinthians 5. And here we have a great white throne in Revelation 20. And him who was seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. Now, I can't tell you exactly the order and way all the judgment takes place, but I do know in this passage it talks about the book of life. And how, is our, how are our names written in the book of life? When we respond to his promises with faith. When we respond to his son and what he has done for us with faith. Our name is written in the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. What I'm hoping and what I think of all this through faith in Jesus and that new covenant that he speaks about. Our sins are all redacted out of the records. But the things that we have done, will, he will remember. But for those who reject his offer of salvation, their names will not be written in the book of life. He says the dead were judged by what was written in the books. So there's more than one book, a book of life and other books that record everything. It says it was written in these books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. 
So again, the order and everything I don't know except Hebrews 9 says this. Just as is it appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin like he did on the cross, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. It appears from here that after we die, immediately in God's realm, we are the judgment comes. And you can have assurance and know that when God makes a promise, it comes true and he is faithful. When God makes the promise that this is his land and that his people, Israel, will live in that land, he will fulfill that promise. When God says that he will send a savior, it goes all the way back to Genesis, where the, the seed of the woman, that there will be this enmity between the, this satanic figure and, and this this son to be born, and he shall bruise his head. The serpent shall smite at his heel, but he shall bruise his head. The one thing you want to be protected if you get into a violent accident is your head. Because if your head is pulverized and bruised and smashed, that's the end. And the prediction was all the way in Genesis and comes right through the Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures, that the Messiah would come and he would bring salvation to the world. So we're all in this valley of decision. And with the help of God, we have to decide who is this Yeshua, who is the Savior? If I'm reading it right, it appears, yeah, we'll be accountable, but believers will be forgiven and yet rewarded, even though we're far from perfect in our lives. And that's where we have to keep our motives in line. I really don't think, at least for myself, maybe you're different. But if I think of serving the Lord and doing things for him and good and so on so that I can get rewarded, I think I get my eye off of the real prize. The real prize is the Lord himself. The real prize is the peace and the pleasures. Psalm 16 there are eternal pleasures in your presence. Those are our prize. None of us deserve any reward. We are only his servants. So Jesus says in all light of this, one is he wants us to trust in him for this forgiveness and for this promise of eternal life and salvation and look forward to the day of the Lord. But he also wants us to keep our motives in line. He says in Luke chapter 17, Will any of one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he comes in from the field, Come at once and recline at the table? He says, Does he thank the servant because he did what he was commanded? And then he tells us this, you, So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. I don't know how many times I've said it, but I've said, I don't care about a big mansion in heaven or rewards or anything. If I had a little shack in the background all by myself in heaven, I'm fine with that. But the amazing thing is, there is reward eternal for serving the Lord God as he said to Moses, he said, I am who I am. And he said it in a way that he is the one who's existed forever, had no beginning. He is the one who exists now and who will never end. That's 
who he is, the eternal God, the only one. And in his presence and in his promises are heaven itself. So we continue now with our prayers. And let us begin, if you, if you would, with me, with silent prayer, and then we'll take a little time for intercessory prayer. And the conclusion of our worship service will be in your bulletin. Father, we love you, we praise you, we worship you. Tov le'adot le'adonai u'lezamer l'shimcha elyon. It is so good to praise you, to worship you, to have, we know that Paul says that while we are here, we are away from you. And yet, we can sense your presence, we enjoy your presence, and how we look forward to the day, Lord, the day of the Lord that has come. Prepare our hearts, and we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would lead us and guide us into all truth, because we know you love us, and you care for us. And Lord, we pray that you'd give us confidence, looking forward to the future of the day of meeting you and being with you. And Lord, we also pray that you'd give us a proper fear of uh, neglecting such so great a salvation. And we pray that you'd give us a proper attitude to just say, we don't deserve anything. We just thank you. If, if only you had just given us forgiveness, it would have been enough for us. But Lord, we, we thank you that you've promised so much more. Move us by your Holy Spirit to serve you all the days of our life, we pray. And Lord, we want to especially pray for Susan and all of her family and the loss of her mother. And Lord, bring uh, your blessing to all of them, to Denny. Lord, we continue to pray for, for Keith and we pray for uh, Joe's son, son-in-law, Stephen, who has just miraculously come back. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So join with me now as we pray uh, Martin Luther's evening prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and his blessing over us. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen.